So uh, this is my first time doing a virtual conference uh, presentation. I'm, I'm uh, hoping I'm doing it all right. Um, I'm excited for it. Uh, it's a nice uh, opportunity. Um, so you're also a bit in my in my house and in my in my own working room. So here's some artwork created by my kids. Um, they are six, four, and one and a half. So if you hear any any screaming or laughing or crying in the background, um, that that's probably going to be my kids. Um, I don't make high pitched sounds. They they do most of the time. Um, so um, the the talk turned. I think a little bit shorter than I uh, anticipated and I expected. Um, so if there's any questions Eric already mentioned, please share them with us and um, I'll see if I can either address them during my, um, during my presentation, otherwise we'll dive into it uh, after. Um, so a war story from failures to success. I want to stress it's multiple failures and I'm not really sure what success means, um, but I will try to share with you um, what we've been doing um, at Enreach. Um, oh, no. All right. So why am I giving this talk? Um, so the conference is full of all kinds of technical content, um, wonderful stories about um, uh, advancing the beam, um, you know, embracing all the other languages in the ecosystem that uh, that's being created. Um, talks about new libraries, etc. Uh, so instead, I'm, I'm going to tell you my story, um, the things we have been doing over the last couple of years. Um, and yeah, the goal is that, you know, it's really okay to uh, experience failures, uh, make mistakes, especially with something that should be as easy going as, as Erlang and the Beam or, or Elixir in our case. Um, um, but yeah, there's also, um, it's also okay to not directly know what to do about it. Um, but yeah, at some point, of course, you got to get to work and you got to get uh, some some solutions. Um, but you know, there's no um, ready to use solution for your one of a kind uh, uh, problem. It's all about finding the right um, the right uh, yeah the right solution for 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 your problem. Um, so it's not about fault tolerancy on the beam. It's more about fault tolerancy as a team and as a company. Um, we all make mistakes and then we go out and we fix them. Um, so there's a small disclaimer about this whole presentation. Um, I might mix we or and I. Um, sometimes they're interchangeable. Sometimes I really mean I, sometimes I really mean we. Um, all of this was a team effort. So we got the success, which was a team effort. Um, I'm the one who represents it. So there, therefore I have to, um, the disclaimer, there's no I in team. We all know this um, exciting catchphrase. Um, so that's why I'm giving this talk. And um, what this talk will, so what this talk will definitely be about um, is more about my experience. Um, and um, yeah, probably you will hear some things you shouldn't really do. Uh, like mistakes we made uh, because we were at the beginning we were new to Elixir or and new to Erlang, um, and I will try to tell you a bit on how we went about solving them. Um, but yeah, again, that's like our unique solution. Um, so I will not cover any very technical deep dive things. Um, I will also not cover like anti patterns or you know this is how you should design your application in order for it to. Uh, to work. Um, so now we'll go into our timeline uh, because it's actually um, about five years um, in 2015 um, that we started building out a new telephony platform for Enreach. Uh, so Enreach is um, a European company based in the Netherlands and we offer communication um, solutions. So telephony, online video calling, et cetera. And um, we had the need to incorporate a lot of features, didn't really work with the platform we had, so we had to start, or we decided to start from scratch. Um, we chose Elixir. The company already had some experience with some Erlang. We had some Erlang code running in production. Um, but I, so this is really I, I started at zero. I didn't know anything about Erlang or Elixir. I had to learn it. 
Um, Elixir was, I think, at 1.0 uh, around that time, so it was all brand new. Um, what we started doing was writing a POC to like prove that what we were set out to build would work. Um, then we started rewriting it, and then uh, we started rewriting it again. Um, and then fast forward, we're in 2017. We spent two years um, writing our application, rewriting it, rewriting it again. Um, during this time, our team grew from two, three engineers to about five, six. And in 2017, um, we had to do a beta launch because at some point uh, you really have to show that, you know, whatever you're building is actually um, going to work. And this beta launch allowed the first customers to start uh, on, this, on this platform and start making phone calls um, and start making use of the newer features we uh, set out to design this platform for. And um, in the beginning, it was a bit, um, we had a lot of glitches, so to say. Um, the basic functionality, uh, for example, phone calls would sometimes not really work. Uh, and on top of that, the shiny new features we set out that were really enabling customers to look afresh at, um, at the communications product we were offering, um, they always worked 100% all the time. Um, so I have a small like spoiler. It should be the other way around. If you build out a new product, your basic features, the thing that everybody expects to work um, because it's there for 50 years, uh, that should really work. And then the shiny new features, they can break sometimes. Um, so customers were really bright, um, but of course we wanted to, to improve this. Um, and um, we made the, the, the basic layer a lot more stable. Uh, we had some race conditions on a TCP socket between two applications. Um, we solved that by um, um, we solved that by having more transactional approach on this TCP socket. Um, yeah, quite a simple solution in the end. Uh, of course, maybe you should have done that from the start. You would say, well. At the start, we thought this event-based approach would work a lot better, uh, unless you figure out that, oh shit, we're missing some events here or there, or the state is suddenly shared between two components. Um, anyway, so these transactions uh, for us, um, we're, solving our specific, uh, we're solving our specific case. Um, and uh, so 27 went along, um, we went to late 2017. Um, I believe late 2017, um, we um, migrated the first real uh, or the, 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 the first um, customers um, that were a bit smaller and did not expect the whole suite of features we had on the old platform. So we had the basic functionality working. Uh, we had some new shiny features working, but there was uh, some kind of, uh, yeah, today you say backlog of features that we didn't implement yet uh, because they were lower on the, on the priority list. Um, so we couldn't move all the customers we wanted, but at least some and get some more uh, feedback. Um, then we found out that given our new approach, and remember we started in 2015, uh, that at the end of uh, 2017, the, the design of the data looked a bit different. So what we ended up with was that uh, for a single user, we would store data on multiple locations. Um, and uh, by, by doing that, we had to synchronize this data in order for, for the platform uh, to work, um, which in the end, of course, didn't really scale or didn't really work or was delayed. Um, so we made another data entity and um, put everything there and made calls out from the other spots of the application where we were reading that data in order to make sure we were reading the same data uh, using the same features. And um, 
that took like one or two months. So during that time, we synchronized a lot back and forth uh, in order to, uh, yeah, at least keep the customers happy and keep them at bay um, until we really had, could solve it. Um, so then we entered um, 2018. So in 2018, um, we solved that and that would allow us, we thought, to go for a big bang and migrate a lot of customers to this new, uh, to this new platform, written from scratch, entirely in Elixir. Um, this all, we slowly started getting some customers, um, but we still uh, had kind of a beta label on our product. So customers were still a bit concerned. They would not straight on move to the, move to the newer version of our platform uh, because they were concerned because in the beginning they heard there were some issues, et cetera. Um, so I think summer 2018, we removed our beta label and we let all the, um, uh, we, we told customers, now it's really good. You can really trust it. Um, now we uh, think we can handle the load um, because functionality wise, the platform worked quite well. There were of course some missing features. Um, we of course load tested the cases that we could think of. Um, but then in, uh, at the end of 2018, um, basically after the summer, uh, we, we, we got more customers, more customers onboarded on this new platform. We migrated some and then, um, we got, we, we get into 2019 already. Oh, I have late 2018 missing one. Um, and in, in late 2018 and beginning of 2019, um, we started to get more load and because of this more load, um, we found out, um, or actually we found out that we didn't know everything about our application that was running in, uh, in production. And, um, looking back, go, going back one slide. So in late 2018, um, it's also, I, 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 instead of me just being part of the team, I became a lead of the team and everything became more clear to me, um, uh, what, what was happening. And, um, we were starting to get more load and a lot of the pieces we've built um, was kind of like a network and everybody made their own patch. But when everything came together, uh, we found out that it wasn't fully aligned with each other. Um, so we didn't have the, the you, I would say we didn't have the proper peer review in order for your um, application uh, to be one coherent, uh, one coherent platform. Um, so there were a lot of knowledge gaps and, and a lot of knowledge islands. And, um, we started seeing various issues that would only show under a specific type of load. So I'm not necessarily talking about, Hey, you have a shit ton of load and now your application starts to crumble apart. No, it was when we had low load, nothing seemed to be wrong. When we got a bit more load, it seemed to go wrong. Everything seemed to go wrong. Then we got even more load and everything seemed fine again. It was really strange. Um, so in the beginning of 2019, um, we had, um, yeah, in the first couple of months, we had multiple single node outages. So we have this Erlang cluster and sometimes one node would, would stop working. And um, we couldn't really pinpoint why, because the entire application was doing a lot of stuff. Um, and for some reason, at some point, a node or like one VM stopped responding to anything. So we tried to open the console, didn't work. Um, we tried to open a web page that was you know, served by that server. No, it took a very, very long time. Um, and it was kind of hard because we didn't have to write telemetry. So we didn't have to write metrics or the right events that we were, that we were looking at. Um, later on, we actually found out 
that uh, at some point um, a specific node uh, was um, was stopping doing any database queries. Uh, but we found this out only after a few months uh, because the issue would occur sporadically and we wouldn't be able to replicate it locally. Um, in the end, I will I will get back to the underlying issue uh, uh, later on. Um, because another issue we had around the same time, which caused us, yeah, which required all our attention, um, was a specific locking that sometimes happened between two processes. And when I tell you that we had a specific locking between two processes, you're like, sure, you shouldn't do that. No, I we knew. Um, however, if you have multiple people working on their islands and one process calls into another process, we all know it's gonna deadlock. However, if nobody knows the full application, you're not gonna find that specific uh, deadlock. So we had to reason um, about our code and try to find like, why does this deadlock between these two processes happen? And is it even a deadlock or is it just some kind of delay um, some kind of delay in the processing of, of the data. Um, I think it took about, uh, yeah, I would say two months of very investigative debugging to find out that these two processes, processes could do a, basically a gen server call to each other um, and thereby made it you know, impossible to um, serve the responses to our, to our clients. Um, then, um, later in 2019, um, when we were still fighting, so we solved our, our process locking that was created. Um, we still had intermittent failure of a node, uh, based on us not being able to access the database anymore. And we, um, opened an issue with, uh, we were, so we're using Elixir and we were using Ecto to talk to the database. Uh, our database is a Postgres database. And um, we opened an issue saying, hey, sometimes it looks like we cannot create a database anymore. We see our, um, we see that we try to do queries, but they're not timing out um, and we're not getting a response. And um, yeah, our database seems healthy because the other nodes who are accessing the same database, it still works. Uh, so we opened an issue with um, uh, the Ecto team on, on GitHub and we solved a few rare uh, edge cases. Um, we tried to replicate it locally because we couldn't. Uh, so we had to explain with core dumps and examples and um, and everything, what kind of issue we had. We all reasoned about this issue and came up with a few improvements um, and not necessarily even with Acta, but with the DB connection library. Um, and, um, but for some reason, and as of today, we still don't know what, what was the uh, root cause of the issue. Um, yeah, we, 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 we couldn't figure out what happened. However, during the same time, we had a huge database outage. Uh, our database filled up and um, we had to expand the disks and everything. And that kind of worked until a few uh, weeks later, uh, somebody by accident um, uh, dropped our database. And I would say, well, you would have the proper restrictions, nobody would ever be able to, to drop the database. Completely right. So we, Enrich is a slightly bigger company and we had a team that operates most of our databases. And um, that team actually didn't support Postgres and we were using Postgres. So we had a couple of long conversations with them. And in the end, we decided to switch from Postgres to MySQL, which is, um, yeah, in my experience, it's an insane switch. There's, uh, I've, I've read multiple blog posts from, from other bigger companies also that switch from one to the other for one or the other reason. Uh, in the end, both of them are relational databases and both have their pros and cons. Um, for us, the biggest pro was somebody else is going to maintain a database versus we're going to maintain 
uh, the database. Um, so one thing that really helped us in migrating is we weren't using any database specific features. Of course, we were using relations. Um, we were using some, um, some, some features that were present both in Postgres as in MySQL. Um, so we migrated, uh, and I must say that I still applaud the effort of, of the entire team to be able to migrate from Postgres to MySQL in about a month of time, uh, including migrating all the data, um, changing a few specific, you know, code specific um, parts of the application to make sure it works with the, with the newer database. Um, and then we migrated to MySQL. And for some reason, um, the, the, the issue with, um, the issue we had with Ecto that would sometimes cause our node to stop working, it, it would, it, it got less, uh, but it was still there from time to time. Then, um, after the summer of 2019, um, again, there was a bigger increase in our, in our customers moving to this platform and we found out we had some bottlenecks on the database. And this is mostly due to uh, MySQL and Postgres doing different types of uh, uh, indexing. Uh, they have different speeds. The service we used were about similar. Um, so we went out, we, for each um, performance hit we took compared to uh, running the same code on Postgres, we applied different indexing strategy. Um, we applied different uh, different database, uh, different table layout, basically in the relational database. And uh, on we went with fixing another step in order to make um, the platform we have like super stable, um, and you know servicing the customers that we promised for a long time already that we would have a new platform with a lot of features. Um, then I would say that September and October in 2019, we had a great time because after a period of about eight months of, um, you know, firefighting, um, and actually when I see the news right now about the fires they have in, uh, uh, in the Western part of the United States, I, I think like, well, that, that, those eight months of 2019 were like that for me. Um, so, I started to feel a bit relieved. I felt like, okay, we did it. We're, we're stable. Uh, we've overcome our uh, shortcomings or we, we've overcome our learnings. We now know, we now have learned uh, to run a big platform on the Erlang VM. Um, of course, when, when you solve the issues you, or the, 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 the problems you made by, um, yeah, apparently not knowing enough or yeah, not knowing enough about the problem domain. Um, you start, yeah, at some point you, feel you, you, you get comfortable and you start to think that you, you master it. Then um, what happened is that the load balancer in, in front of our application uh, crashed, which never happened before. We were using it for quite some time already, uh, but it crashed. Um, and we are also using Phoenix because it's the cool thing in, in, a, in Elixir land to do. And we were using a lot of the WebSocket functionality. However, when clients would connect on our WebSocket, uh, we would often immediately fetch some data from the database. Um, and over time, when your customer amount grows and grows and grows, um, you get more um, clients connected. And when the load balancer drops, underneath your feet and then comes back online, you suddenly have a lot of clients connecting to, um, to our application at the same time. And all of them are trying to fetch the data from the database. Um, and it's a situation we never had before. So of course the solution is quite easy. Um, the data that you think you need frequently for these connections, you're gonna cache it. So you either use uh, ETS um, or you use some gen surfer that populates this data for you once and then you surf it to all the clients that are fetching for it. Um, but yeah, doing this uh, beforehand 
uh, would not necessarily have made sense because maybe for the specific feature, uh, we would have come up with something else. Um, so yeah, it's each and every time you, you find out new issues. So we thought, uh, you know, 2019, um, what for me was a long, long, uh, long year. And um, when it was over, uh, we entered 2020. And I thought 2020 is going to be the year that we uh, don't have to worry about, about fighting our issues because we've solved most of them. Uh, the application works pretty well. Now we can add more features. And now we can really start shining because this new platform allows for more rapid um, uh, development and it, and it does and I still I, I still believe it does um, however what happened this year come on this this year is insane um, as I've mentioned we, we, we are servicing telephony customers mostly um, but we also have our own video calling solution and what so in the Netherlands we entered lockdown in March 10 or 11 or 12, something like that. Um, so the first two months were nice and breezy. Um, and then in March, suddenly this happened. And um, we said, well, we have a video calling solution. There's lots of, um, yeah, there's lots of people out there that want video calling solutions. And not everybody trusts Zoom or any other US company doing video solutions. Uh, and we do have a video calling uh, product uh, that works completely in the browser, don't have to install anything, shoot onboard users easily. Um, so we said, we're gonna give this away for free because it's so rock solid. However, up until that time, we were using it internally and there were a few customers using it. So the, the increase in usage of our video, video calling application or yeah, web application, I should say, yeah, it was like tenfold or hundredfold. It was insane. It peaked in traffic. Of course, what you find out is that when that application was designed, um, we were communicating with the media gateway for the actual media, um, but all the signaling went, went through our application and all the logic and handling of, of the rooms and the, the audio, etc. cetera. And um, what, what then became clear um, was that we were using per node a single gen surfer to communicate with our media gateway, which means that each client that wanted to say, hey, I want to join this, uh, this video call, like this Zoom call right now, for every client that would join, it would go to the same gen surfer. So we, we created the bottleneck in our application uh, before we even knew that we were gonna, yeah, that, we're, that we were gonna hit that specific bottleneck. Um, of course, again, it wasn't too hard to refactor, um, but as you know, the business all, always goes first. So first you start selling it or giving it away for free, and then you have about two weeks, three weeks, four weeks to, um, yeah, to, to, to try and solve the bottlenecks you find uh, in that time. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really glad that we managed to uh, solve that pretty quickly because it allowed us to, to actually grow this product even further. It, it was the perfect time to, uh, to kind of relaunch it. Um, so yeah, that was, that was really uh, a lot of fun um, to, to start the year off. And of course, we've had our glitch here or there for small things. Um, but I would say that after kind of a year of, of fixing things um, and, and firefighting these things, uh, we've managed to come out uh, quite well. Um, so I want, to, I want to go to a bit of closing right now. I, I hope you enjoyed my story. Um, I, I want to share with you the key takeaway because I, for me, um, usually I, I, I see a lot of technical talks or I try to give a technical talk myself. Um, and those are always very interesting and I could do a deep dive in one of the particular issues we had in, in 2019. Um, 
But the, the key takeaway here is really like failures are super easy. It's super hard. It's super easy um, to, to, to make something that doesn't work. Um, and once that happens, that's fine. Um, you're still there. Um, you, have, you just have to work in order to solve it and, and learn from uh, what you did wrong and then um, do it better. Um, and yeah, there, there are really no shortcuts. You, you have to learn this. Uh, part of it is the hard way. Yeah, part of it is um, just, you know, learning about the business domain um, you're working on. Um, yeah, I, I came up with a few other titles for this talk and I, I thought about wanting to share them, um, but I'm not going to share them uh, because this is way too much fun. Um, so yeah, this is, this is my story from going from a lot of failures, um, a lot of uh, outages um, to, to success, to a, to a platform that's, uh, that, I would, that I dare to say is, is stable now. And of course, this means that there will be more challenges to face uh, and that, that there will be more uh, learnings to, to get. Um, I, I, I truly believe that, that the Beam and the, uh, for, in my case, Elixir, that the Beam is really a nice tool uh, to be able to do this, uh, to be able to do this with. Um, so thanks for, for listening to my story. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and if there's any questions or any feedback, please, uh, please let me know. My name is Tim Overlaan. Uh, you can find me on the CodeSync uh, website, or if you search for me, you can also find me on these other social uh, networks or during this conference on, uh, I think it's pronounced Hoover. Might be wrong. Thanks a lot, Timo. Great, great talk. And uh, I, I really appreciate that, that you dare to share uh, sort of the, the mistakes and the failures because we all know that it happens. But sometimes the stories, the storytelling is like, yeah, yeah, but everything was was shiny and it worked really well from the from day one and so on and so forth. And everyone knows that that's not the case. So, so thank you very much for sharing that. I really like the the, the the quote here that you said: fault tolerance, uh, not only for the product, but as a team and, and as a company. I mean, if you can if you can have that resilience or fault tolerance and build that into your ways of working and your, your company culture, you've come a very long way. Uh, yep. and then you can sort of face, face anything and fix it. So, so thank you for, for sharing. And we're going to see if there are any questions on the, on the Hoover app. Yeah, we have one here. So this is from, let's see, it's from uh, Saba Hoch. How did you solve the knowledge island problem? Um, I, I mean, I, I think by now uh, it, it, it is indeed solved. Um, it takes a long time. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of approaches where people just try to um, pair the knowledge holder or like force the knowledge holder to pair with somebody um and work together uh but i've often seen that especially when there are issues that the knowledge holder is dying to actually solve those issues um we have along the way restructured the team which which allowed for for most of this and um in the end it's actually the the the, the people that feel that they that they don't know about a certain thing uh, is they want to get that knowledge. And from my perspective, it's really more about, about enabling them um, to make them feel safe, uh, to, to ask a lot of questions and to try and, and own some other part of the, of the code base. And um, yeah, for me also, if you work in a team uh, and you have six people um, that, that's too much. You have four people knowing a lot about different parts and you have four people not knowing so much. This is kind of how our team grew. Yeah, doing a one-on-one -on -one pairing not always works uh, because the, the, then the pairs have to be like matches um, uh, to, to work well together. Um, 
and I must say that uh, during this time, I also, yeah, I also learned that, um, yeah, that, that, that wouldn't scale fast enough. Uh, so in the end, what we tried to do, we did a lot of um, uh, pair programming sessions and mod programming sessions in order to try to distribute that knowledge faster. Um, but it takes a bit of, of will from everyone and um, yeah, you should try to create some energy out of it. Um, yeah, so there, there's not a clear cut answer, but we, we, I think for most of what we did was um, required reviewing of all the code and um, not necessarily to say, hey, we should emerge this, but also to ask questions. Uh, if I see, um, if I see some, if I, if I'm doing a code review, I'm not only trying to see, is this person committing the code? I like to see I'm, I'm trying to see, do I understand what this person is doing? And uh, if I do, that's, that's fine. And then yeah, pair and mob programming, I think. Yeah. So follow up question from my side there. Um, when you talked about the code reviews, would, would the whole team review the code or would it be a single person reviewing it? Because in a sense, code reviews, if you think about mob programming or pair programming, those are like continuous code reviews in a sense with, with, with the two people or the, the whole team. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when we would do mob, so pair programming, um, then we still did code reviews. For mob programming, we didn't really. Um, as soon as the whole team was involved, it would just be writing the code and the knowledge would be shared already. Uh, so the reviews is really for the parts that you didn't do mob programming on. Um, and then we kind of, on every PR we created, we notified the whole team. So the whole team was aware. And then it was more up to the person getting notified, like, hey, I want to learn something about this um, and, and giving the time for that. And in the end, I feel that, um, yeah, if, if you can make the full team feel ownership for, for the product that you're shipping, they will want to learn, or at least that this is how I work. So I'm not sure if this is applicable to everyone, um, but you're not going to tell me that the more junior people or the new hire doesn't want to get his hands dirty because they're there to actually do something for the company. Um, so it's just, you need to get in that uh, motivation of, of, of those, uh, you, you need to get that motivation or that energy uh, in order to get them wanting to learn. And then, yeah, it will go a bit more naturally. And then, yeah, f f I'm, I'm not sure if this is clear, but. Uh, I, I, I think I understand what you mean. I, I think it sounds really, really cool that, that you sort of invite rather than, than push. It's, it's a pool-based approach. I mean, you create the, 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 the space for, for people to, to learn rather than uh, pushing them to learn. So, so that sounds really, yeah. really cool. Another, another interesting aspect is that, um, so when we started this project, it was Elixir 1.0, uh, and we've been able to keep up um, with Elixir until 1.8, and then it slowed down a bit because our priorities shifted a little bit. Um, still trying to go to 1.10 uh, soon. And, um, this um, uh, somewhere, I, I, maybe it was Elixir 1.7. I, I, I don't remember exactly, uh, but the format that was introduced. And uh, we had a long discussion about it, if we should, do, <laughs> if we should uh, um, get it or not. In the end, we chose to get the formatter. And then we had to format a lot of code. And with a formatter, it's so that, of course, you can just say format everything and commit and be done and go to the next thing. Um, but what I've read about it is that you better, uh, look at what you're formatting in order to, to actually make sure it's, it's becoming more readable. Um, so certain people would go in our code base refactor or, or, or format apart, find out that something formatted really badly, uh, and then try to refactor that little part, um, which required them to understand what was going on. Um, yeah, if 
I think it's projects like these, um, yeah, that, that allow people to, to, to learn, but from an approach that's really necessary without being there a big, um, so often when, when you want to build a new feature and, uh, some, yeah, the, the customer wants it or the business needs it or whatever, there is some pressure. But if you're formatting the code base, the pressure is from inside the team, uh, which makes it a lot easier to say, okay, we're just going to take off a little bit of the pressure. Then, yeah, customer X wants to get this new shiny feature. Uh, so there's more time for learning with uh, maintenance uh, like that. That's a really cool insight as well. I mean, this kind of friendly peer pressure. I mean, maybe pressure is the wrong word, but you have this peer your peers, your, your pals, your, your colleagues sort of helping out to, to improve the code. So, so I really like that. So we have another question from, from Ali Farhadi. Uh, so have you ever regretted choosing a Elixir for your journey? Hi, Ali. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Um, sorry, what was the question? Have I ever regretted, uh, regretted. Choos choosing a Elixir? Um, nope, never. Nope. I, I think given the size of, uh, so given the size of the project we started, um, building something from scratch is, is something I would not reconsider. Um, that I will not think about doing again. Um, but uh, yeah, but yeah, definitely if, if I would have a new project, I would definitely pick Elixir again. It's, uh, I would I would pick Erlang as well. Actually, it wouldn't matter that much to me. Um, but I I think Elixir is a great language. I really like it. That's why I'm actually uh, giving a presentation here. So I would definitely pick uh, pick Elixir again. But I would try to scope the size of the project like much and much smaller, and start to show it to customers much and much sooner. Um, that's uh, yeah. That's part of part of the lessons I learned. Um, working on this uh, project. Sort of the, the, the fast feedback from customers to see that you're, you're doing the right thing and, and you, have, you have the right scalability, for instance. For in yeah, 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 but all, yeah, yeah. And also to get those early uh, mistakes you're making with, with designing the application or early bottlenecks, it's, it's easier to find them, find them sooner, I think. <laughs> 